Hello and welcome to the Three Books from Hearts and Minds podcast. My name is Phil Schiavone, your co-host and producer of the show from the Coalition for Christian Outreach, where we're transforming college students to transform the world. With me today from Hearts and Minds Books, the host with the most to say about the books that you should be reading, Byron Borger. Byron, how are you doing today? I'm doing good today, Phil. Thanks. It's always great to hear from you and it's fun to be on this uh, this podcast. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. And I love being on this podcast because you give such great book recommendations. And over vacation, uh, while Sam Levy, our friend Sam, was substituting for me, I read one of your recommendations. I read Salvation on Sand Mountain from a couple Ooh, of episodes memoir. ago. Yeah. And I just wanted to give my own quick reflection on it. We invite listeners to do this all the time to give feedback and figured I'd model it here real quick. And you gave an excellent review of it. And I think for me, what really hits me is you, you talked about Covington's sort of like all out personality. If, if he's going to cover something, he's going to cover the civil war in South America that's going on. He's going to, if he's going to cover this trial with snake handling preachers trying to murder their wife, he's going to get right there and get to know everybody. And, and uh, what, what I felt I learned from it was Covington without giving too much away. We never want to spoil the whole book, but he was able to reconcile some of his own nature about being this all out type of guy and this need to not only be with the snake handling church and these pastors, but is he going to handle a snake himself? I, so he's got to like reconcile his own nature and he ends up reconciling with the nature of God himself <laughs> through that journey. And the, the, the kind of like the, the chapter of the book for me that really hit it is when he's like, deciding whether or not am i going to go through with handling the snake or not that was the part where like i could not put the book down i was like hearts pumping reading word for word like flipping the page as fast as i can but when i put the book down at the end i had to do some introspection about my character and what parts of me are do i need to reconcile back to myself on my journey with god what part of my personality is is left wanting right of like and wow. to go through with it and to, to be inspired enough to to see it through the hard stuff and pick up things along the way to learn and not not be afraid, right? Not be afraid of what the consequences yeah. might be. And he he does that. He he has his own moments of fear for sure. It's not like he didn't have any fear, but the reconcil reconciliation of his own character, his own personality, and how it brought about a reconciliation with God and with others. Yep. What a beautiful book. So I just wanted to throw my own review and reflection. If you had any other like thoughts on, on the book. I or my love hearing thoughts, you love say that, Phil. It's great to hear you ruminate on a book that you enjoyed and the page turning the pages so quickly uh, in, in certain parts. And then there's other parts that are slower when he's reflective and doing this fairly thoughtful analysis of who he is and this God that he's coming to get to know through these Appalachian snake handling churches you're right he's a new york sort of atheist liberal journalist who's covering this story about murder and mayhem in an appalachian fundamentalist church and ends up in northern alabama uh man what a story dennis covington he died recently he's written three or four other equally um uh high octane books but this is his most famous salvation on sand mountain. So I'm glad uh, other listeners maybe were listening in last uh, time when we talked about those things. And Phil, I'm glad you enjoyed reading that memoir by Covington. Um, I'll tell you about others uh, that he wrote another day because he's, he's quite a writer. Well, that's great. And thanks again for recommending it. And I was reading it while at the beach evading the heat wave that we've been in yeah. in South central PA. It was actually like 10 degrees cooler at the beach Mother yes. Nature has been wreaking havoc on South Central PA where you and I are at, but I hear you've got three books on the nature, the nature of creation and nature around us. And Byron, would yep. you just lead us right into the three books that you have for us today? Okay, for our three books from Hearts and Minds, for your hearts and minds, I'm just going to tell you about three books and I'm going to sneak in a fourth if I can, if nobody counts, uh, to talk about the glories of being in the outdoors. Summer's a time for me when I Oftentimes, I turn on a light or if my porch light isn't working, which it doesn't sometimes, I literally get an extension cord. I get something to drink and I sit out in the dark in my backyard and I read out there outside, listen to the birds and stuff. I really enjoy reading in the outdoors, reading by the beach, reading by a lake or anywhere I can get 
And so maybe some of our listeners have that experience of reading in the outdoors. And so I thought I'd uh, just highlight real quickly a couple of books that help us appreciate that. The first one is a, a book. It's maybe not for everybody, but it's called The Book of Nature, The Astonishing Beauty of God's First Sacred Text. It's by a woman named Barbara Mahaney, published by Broadleaf. Now, what you should know, and some of you may know this, the book of nature is actually an old phrase used in the late Middle Ages into the early days of the modern world when Christians who were scientists said that God wrote two books. He wrote the Bible, but he also wrote his first word when he spoke words into being and said, let there be light, and, and the creation was, was, was made. And so the creation is called the book of nature, and then the Bible's the, the book of, of the words. And so that is not an uncommon phrase to call the creation a book. <laughs> and you read the book of nature. You read God's word. And in fact, the scriptures say that. If we had time, we could unpack some of the Bible study. Like where Job, it says, listen to the fish and they will speak to you. I don't know what that means. But literally, the animals will talk to you. Psalm 19 starts out and says, there's not exactly words, but day by day, God speaks uh, through the heavens. They declare the glory of God. There is no words, but they speak. And so the word, the natural word of God in the creation is something we can read and enjoy. So this is the astonishing beauty of God's first sacred text. I want to tell you three things about this book. Firstly, she is a writer who's a good, good writer. She's literate and eloquent and poetic. She wrote a book about being a mother and the spirituality of motherhood on Abington, a United Methodist publishing house. And then it was so successful, they did a little prayer book that went with it for moms. Uh, and it was a cut above some of the evangelical books about mothering and focusing on the family and so on. These were really rich, thoughtful, eloquent prayers and a spirituality and a motherhood that Barbara Mahaney wrote. So I like her as a writer. This takes her writing craft the next step up. It is eloquent and poetic. If you like the nature poetry of somebody like Mary Oliver, you'll appreciate this book a lot. In fact, there is some poetry in here. There's litanies of what she calls astonishment. And so it is about being uh, attuned to God's word in the world and the astonishment we can get when we sit in wonder at the beauty of things. Now, she is not about necessarily going out to the Grand Canyon uh, to look at the greatest Rocky Mountains in the world or the greatest canyons or waterfalls in the world, but she does this in her own backyard in her own hiking and establishment of her own sense of place. We live in this sort of nautilus, she says, of prayer. <laughs> if we have sort of the sensibilities to sense it and appreciate it. So for her, the appreciation of nature and the glories of the beauty of, of, of her local backyard, the sun and the moon and the birds um, is actually a moment of prayer. So that's where this book is going, this sort of in spiritually infused creation that we can be astonished by as we take in the newness of each day. So I'm not quite there yet. I don't have this mystical encounter with God every time I look at the beauty of the world. But, you know, sometimes there are moments, maybe with you too, there are moments when you, you sense God's presence in the great outdoors. So anyway, this is a wonderfully written book. Padraig Otuma, who's a poet that is well known these days, uh, guy from uh, from Ireland. It's a great, great poet. He has a blurb in the back of this, and he says, attention is among the deepest forms of integrity. In the book of nature, Barbara Mahaney doesn't look through nature. She looks at nature and there sees the mysteries that make and unmake us. A theological, poetic, and devoted plea for attention to our most fundamental constitution, which is matter stuff, life, the world. God made the world, said it was good, and we can now embrace it and, and take it and read it. So anyway, Barbara Rahaney helps us read and pay attention to and look at stuff. Um, birds, sky. One of the other little things in the back of this, there's what she calls a bookshelf of wonder. And she has sort of long paragraphs, maybe one or two in a page, annotations of the best books about, um, about nature, about creativity in nature, about the spirituality of nature, uh, things like Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek that won a Pulitzer Prize, that sort of stuff. So that little epilogue, which is the bookshelf of her favorite books about wonder, 
is worth the price of the book. So there's one I wanted to tell you about. While I'm talking about poetry and, and, and you know beautiful writing of that sort about nature, uh, before I shift into another title, I want to sneak another one in here. It is called sure. Looking Up, A Birder's Guide to Hope in the Midst of Grief. It's by a lovely woman named Courtney Ellis, evangelical writer. It's on InterVarsity Press. This Looking Up is both a book about recovery of grief. If you've lost a loved one, she loses a grandparent. Um, but by way of learning to become a birder a bird watcher, as they call them. So she's a birder, and she describes the glories of this hobby, of this avocation, of paying attention to all the different kind of house finches and sparrows and mockingbirds and albatrosses and hummingbirds. Every chapter is a different bird. But in the narrative about these birds, she's coming to grips with coping with her grief and finding hope in this broken world. Looking up a birder's guide to hope through grief. I wanna kind of put it next to an ending conversation with this book of nature, which is about astonishment. And this is astonishment, but also by finding the presence of Jesus in your hard times. Uh, if this is about the joy and the beauty and of oneness with creation, this is about finding it during times of difficulty and pain. And uh, it is wonderfully written. It's not. Uh, sad really at all, although she narrates some sad stuff in her life, but it is about hope through grief by looking at the birds, which by the way, Jesus commanded us to do. So people that take the scripture seriously and say, oh, this sounds a little touchy feely, you know, it's weird. No, Jesus said, consider the lilies and look at the birds. So anyway, looking up by Courtney Allen. So that's one book there, two in conversation, but one piece. The second one I want to talk about, Phil, is about doing this with children. I won't say much about it because um, it's, it's just too much to talk about in this book, but I really recommend it. There's a number of uh, academic and sort of secular books, if you will, that are showing the academic scholarly work that's been done to show that children need the outdoors. The kids that don't play, that don't play in nature, that don't play in the grass, that don't get their feet dirty, literally handling dirt is healthy for babies. Literally, there's something about ba being barefoot in the dirt. And so your psychosocial and physical health depends on being out of doors. They've documented that. And there's tons of books about that being wild in nature. This is sort of like that, but it's an evangelical Christian approach. It's called Rooted in Wonder, Nurturing Your Family's Faith Through God's Good Creation. I love this language. We in uh, the CCO have this big conference everybody knows about called Jubilee, where we talk about the narrative of creation, fall, redemption, and the restoration God's bringing to the creation. We always start with the goodness of creation because everything about Christianity, Jesus and the cross and the resurrection and sin and guilt and hope, it all is based on the goodness of creation that God is rescuing. Nothing happens anywhere else except in God's world. So... Um, so talking about the doctrine of creation is so, so important. And I like this language, rooted in wonder, nurturing your family's faith through God's creation. It masterfully, I mean, it's, she's really a good writer and a good thinker, masterfully, masterfully connects scripture and parenting through nature and then back to God. So it is a book about spiritual formation amongst little ones and families by using nature to do so. Rooted in wonder. Uh, here's what one uh, writer put about it. Matthew Sleeth, who is a me medical doctor, become ecologist. He says, with joy and practical know-how, Aaron Lynham, that's the author, Aaron Lynham, helps parents connect the beauty of creation and love for the creator. Beauty for the creation and love for the creator. Rooted in wonder is a must read for helping the next generation to get outdoors and to get to know God. So it's not hard to read, although it is not simplistic. It gives both some theological justification for doing all this, but it also gives you some real practical ideas, things you can do as a parent, depending on the age of your own children. It's not exactly a self-help guide, although there's a lot of exercises and suggestions and bullet points that she gives you. But there's also even some like little art, little black and white illustrations here that some who are watching it online might see. I mean, it's just a handsome, attractive book, lots of Bible, lots of practical stuff, but also some good theology of creation. So I love this book, Rooted in Creation. It's published by Kriegel Publications, um, and it's uh, it's going to instill a love for the natural world in, in your, your family and in your children especially. 
And that's also what, a what, bunch of thoughts. What did your, uh, what did your do, kids do when you were laying at the beach, Phil? You were reading a book. Were they out running around? Well, okay. So I I actually published a blog post on my Substack about the ocean being an altar for me. Amen. And I had this amazing experience. I won't go into the whole story, but I'll, I'll put the link in the description for those that are curious. But I actually met God, not through the ocean, but through a seagull eating my lunch while the oh, kids were playing. Yeah. And so I will leave it at that. I'll leave a teaser out there. But I had this profound, I, I mean that, I, I had this profound experience of God in my anger towards the seagull that would not have come about if I was not in this prayerful setting of the ocean always being an altar for me, always being this somehow it transforms me right into a place of prayer. And then the seagull snatching my lunch while I was praying. And so I, yes, I, I am excited about these books and how they can help people experience God in nature. And I will put a link to that post in the description you know, if you want to hear more almost, about how that. Uh, it's so universal. It's almost a cliche, but it's mm -hmm. so true that people that, that meditate on the ocean, it just keeps coming. It's just faithful mm -hmm. like God. It just, it, sometimes it's bigger, sometimes it's smaller, but the waves just, you can't turn them off. Uh, and there's something about God's faithfulness and God's awesomeness and God's regularity in this ordered creation that yet is can be, be be pleasant and can be scary at times. But there's something about the ocean. Of course, in the Bible, the ocean is also a scary place, often a place of chaos. And so God tames the, the seas as well. And so there's so much to think about when you start thinking about water and the dangers and beauties of the ocean. So thanks for mentioning that. And the daggone seagulls. Yep. <laughs> Well, let me tell you about another book about a guy that's moved there. Um, uh, two of these, uh, all three of these books are deeply spiritual, and, and at least two of them are on evangelical publishing houses. There's nothing the least bit uh, odd about, uh, uh, certainly not the, the last two that I mentioned. The first one, she's a little mystical at times, and she quotes Mary Oliver and all kind of poets and stuff. So these are all really fine books. This one has got a little tiny bit of controversy in it. And I don't mind saying this. This guy's an acquaintance. His name is uh, Tony Jones. And Tony's a character that some of us know because he's written bunches of books about the interior life, about prayer and spirituality, and what 20 years ago we called the emerging conversation. There was a generation emerging about church that needed a church that uh, for kids that were turned off to churches, and then were grappling with what we then called postmodernity, the postmodern worldview and the shift and understanding of relationships instead of data, and God is present instead of just out there. And Tony was in the middle of all that stuff. And so he was sort of a controversial youth worker that wrote books to help young people come to deeper faith. Well, I hate to say it, and I do hate to say this, but it's true. Tony sort of got so burned out in that conversation that he sort of left the church. He didn't leave his Christian faith, but he's very candid in conversations with people and in this book called The God of Wild Places, that in his healing and in his hurt, from the dumbness of so many churches in those years where he was sort of a leader of conversation, unlike, say, his friend Brian McLaren, who endured and became a more liberal Christian, but still is a Christian. He's still a Christian, but he doesn't go to church anymore because he finds God in nature. Now, that can be a cliche and it can be a cop out. And I don't buy that myself just for, for what it's worth. I don't think that's wise. But for Tony, healing came in a canoe in hunting trips, in taking other people on wilderness trips where they are face to face with the wildness of God. This is, I think, except for his admission that he doesn't go to church anymore, which just irritates me to no end. But other than that, this is one of the best books I have ever read about finding God in wilderness encounters. CCO friends do that really well. We have a whole team of people that take college students on these trips. And this book isn't exactly what CCO does because we want to link the power of Jesus and the authority of the word and the call to be in Christian community in churches in all that we do. So this is not a CCO kind of book, but man, it is really, really good. What's also interesting about Tony's book, The God of Wild Places, the subtitle is Rediscovering the Divine in the Untamed Outdoors. So you get this sense that God is wild. He cannot be put in a box. And you can really not encounter that sitting in a comfortable, air-conditioned uh, set of orderly pews. <laughs> um, you really need to get out there in the wilderness, as the Bible itself says. 
there's Bible stories about wildernesses and about mountains and about scary stuff that happens where you encounter the demonic and you find God's still small voice in the midst of the creation where the trees are literally clapping their hands in praise. So he does a lot of theology in this book. Curiously enough, solid theology, good conversation about God's uh, differentness, his holiness, but also his presence, his his uh, being completely unlike anything, and yet he identifies with his creation and speaks it into being. So there's good theological reflection here. There are powerful stories, including a very moving story about his own father's fear of death, about him shooting his first deer. He's a hunter. Some writers of the spirituality in the outdoors feel fine. Uh, I find that they're very... Um, poetic and gentle. And like these other books I mentioned, they they like the awe and the wonder. And so they tend not to be hunters. Tony actually hangs out with a lot of kind of uh, ordinary middle-class men to go hunting and fishing. He's gone to these big conventions where, you know, you buy guns to shoot moose and stuff. He is really an adventuresome guy. And although he respects nature immensely, he is not averse to hunting and fishing. So there's hunting in here, there's fishing in here, there's hiking in there. There's a, a solitude trips and group trips where they process the great untamed wilderness in a way to find something new about God that you, frankly, he thinks you can't find anywhere else. So it is a pretty amazing book. My friend Barbara Brown Taylor, an eloquent Episcopal woman, so she doesn't immediately come to my mind as a hunter or a fisherman. She says, I have read a lot of books in my life, but never one like this. Wherever you are in the food chain, a passionate hunter like Tony or a cauliflower steak eater like me, this captivating memoir will take you places you might have never gone on your own into the elemental mysteries of life, death, creatureliness, and divinity with someone who has turned from the orderliness of religion to find salvation in the God of the wild. She says, I'm glad I went with him. So it's a it's a fascinating book. It is not theologically precise in every way that the CCO might like, but man, what a read it is. The God of Wild Places, Rediscovering the Divine in the Untamed Outdoors by Tony Jones. And it is uh, published by Roman and Littlefield. So there you go. Some books about the outdoors, some that you will adore, some that you will find helpful, and some that might shake you up a little bit. But man, these are great reads to read, particularly here in the middle of the summer. Yeah, I love it. And uh, I'm already back to what you were saying at the top, where summer is a good time to read outside. I've got a back porch that I love to just turn. I've got Christmas lights that I just leave up all year round, though, the, the yellow bulbs and just put those on for some soft light, light a citronella candle and just read on the back porch for a while. I yep. yep. love to be able to engage with nature, both in context of my chair as well as the context of the book yeah. in my hands and these are three excellent titles that you've given us all to do just that really pre appreciate that byron anything else to to say to close us out before i close this out uh, close us out man i just uh, so appreciate our people that listen people that buy books from us people that are interested in reading and if there's anything we can do at hearts and minds to help you in that journey it's great to talk about these books but we'd love for you to send us some orders or at least some inquiries and we can chat about ways to get these into your hands yeah, thanks. And I'm, my closing thought here, too, is, and I won't preach, I'm not going to preach here, I'm tempted to, but uh, even just thinking through that last book, there are, there are pretty many stories, especially in the Old Testament, where when the Israelites get too comfortable inside their own four walls, God seems yeah. to push them, yeah. and then push them out into the wild and exile them and, and yeah. grapple with the reality of creation. And think of the book of Job, and of course, like first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles, and there's so many stories that actually end up that way where you kind of get you get pushed out and then you have to experience God in new ways. So I, I think there's something to be said here for what the Bible points us to in a lot of ways about, uh, I'll just say it like our 21st century Western comfort that we have with our faith that could be gained from books like this. And so I, I really appreciate even that that push you're giving me here on this episode and hope our listeners feel the same. So thank you for that, Byron. And thank you, uh, listeners, for listening. Thank you so much for tuning in once again. Just want to remind you that if you would know, if you would like to place an order for these books or any books, uh, it'll be the first link in the episode description below, no matter what platform you're tuning in on. 
Please make sure to like and share these episodes so we can continue to reach more audiences with these great book recommendations. Uh, our contact information, my, my own, Byron's, as well as Sam's, will be in the description below. Sam from our last episode. And of course, we want you to read these books. We would love to hear the feedback that you have on these books, the feedback like I gave at the top of this episode. We would love to hear how it's impacting you uh, so we can continue to grow to impact others through the ministry of books. And that's that's what Hearts and Minds is all about, is, is making sure that we have these opportunities to grow through using our hearts and our minds and reading widely. So for Byron and Hearts and Minds, as well as myself and the CCO, this has been another episode of the three books from Hearts and Minds podcast. Mm -hmm.